I'm here right now on Let's Talk About It with Slam. Uh, I am super excited today. I got coach Kenny Blakeney. Uh, he, he was a McDonald's All-American, played at Duke. He went on to coach. He coached me for four years at Harvard, which we're going to get into a little bit. Now he's a head coach at Howard doing big things. And so, um, Coach Kenny, thanks for joining us. And, uh, man, this is, this is awesome. What's up, Jay? That's such a pleasure to be on with you to have this conversation uh, that I think is going to be fun, but also impactful. So I'm looking forward to it. Your basketball IQ, your ability, like you have, you know, you're, you're one of the smartest players I've ever been around and I've, I've seen. So you, your, your, your playmaking ability from, you know, be it your ability to score the ball or your ability to make your teammates better was just truly different that I've seen at the college level. And I'm like, I'm seeing all this and, you know, kind of patiently just watching day by day by day and saying, this dude's different. And for me, like, you know, it wasn't a thing about, you know, hey, like your race or anything like that. I was just looking at your talent. I wasn't judging you for anything different than that. And right, wrong or indifferent, you know, it's very unfortunate that, you know, we are judged on being black or you being Asian or whatever the, the races are. Um, those kind of titles uh, are things that people probably see before they actually can see our ability and our talent and who we really are as people. Yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, hearing you talk, I mean, it's nice for me because you're saying like, look, you had talent, you're tough, you're tough. Like you have quick feet. Um, like your ability to stop and go. And to me, the reason why that, you know, I, I really appreciate that is because it's not like I'm deceptively athletic or like, you know, I, I'm, I'm deceptively tough or I'm deceptively whatever. Like that kind of has been my thing that has always been brought to me is like, oh, like even now, as I try to make the NBA this past season, it's like, well, does he have dog? Like that's questions, quite, those are the questions that were being asked to my agent and I'm like, you don't think I have a dog in me? Like, you don't think I'm a killer? Like, you think I grew up and everybody, I had a target on my back and everybody thought I was, chump, uh, you know, a chump and lunch meat my whole life. And you don't think I have a fire in me? Like, and now I play nine years and you're still questioning whether I have a fire, like a competitiveness. Um, like that type of stuff is like the tag that I can't shake. Like for you, I really appreciate it. You're just like, no, like you had great feet. It was period, end of sentence. Like it wasn't about anything else. It wasn't about like, man, it was quicker feet than I thought. Like, I can't believe you had quick feet. Like. I haven't seen that on, you know, like, and so there was no like filter that you were looking at me through. And I really appreciate that. One of the things like I've always appreciated about you is that like, you always went above and beyond, you know? And like, that's why my relationship with you was so special was like when, and people don't know this, when I decided to declare for the NBA draft, like I stopped going to school. Like I was at school on campus, but I stopped going to classes and I was in the gym every day twice a day with coach Blake and then in the weight room. And then sometimes I come back at night by myself for a fourth workout. My senior year, we're playing in Cornell, at Cornell and Cornell was like the best team then. They ended up going on to play in the Sweet 16, but we were trying to challenge them for the title and we were legitimate uh, contender to them. A huge game, huge game, first quarter. Um, their teammate, their team, they just keep calling me a chink to my face, ref is hearing it. You know, our team is hearing it. Oliver McNally, uh, our point guard um, at the time, who, you know, was like almost going to get in a fight with them and like was screaming at the ref, like you're hearing them call Jeremy a chink and you're not even doing anything about it. What's going on? Meanwhile, I'm like stunned and angry and confused and like pissed. So I end up, you know, I remember I, I played terrible. We lost by 20 or 30. I fouled out the game. I was running people over. I just put my head down and I just self-destructed. And um, and to me, like that was a turning point in my life because I was like, never again will I let racism make me a worse basketball player or a worse person. Never again will I allow somebody else's words about my skin color get me to a place where I'm basically feeding into what they want to happen, which is for me to self-destruct. And so, you knew that and then you found me after the game a little small little corner of the cornell locker room 
and I'll let you take the story from here. But playing at Duke during the early '90s, uh, we had an incredible team, and anywhere we go, we would like you know fans were just uh, very harsh on us. And uh, I think it was my sophomore year, we're playing down at Clemson uh, in Clemson, South Carolina, and you know you're down there. It's the South. Uh, you know, it, there's not many people that look like you in the in the in the city in the town. Uh, you look up in the stands. There's not many minorities, uh, and you know they're playing pretty well right at this point in time. Um, and so I'm in the game, and you know the the students were so close to the court. I just remember uh, hearing you know every time that I got to a specific point in the court, you know people yelling the N word at me, and I'm just kind of like, whoa, you know you're actually yelling the N word at me and we're in the South. I'm like, this is real. But I kind of, I had to challenge or or channel that, you know, um, that, 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 that moment and try to, you know, because at the time I I was a, I was a guy, I was a rotation player. I wasn't getting many minutes. So how do I have success during this moment where somebody's screaming and yelling racial uh, you know, sensitive things at me, but I, I need to have success and play well to continue to get the minutes that I was getting being a rotation player. So when I see you experiencing the things that you experience uh, at Cornell, you know, part of me is saying like, we're, we're on an Ivy League campus. <laughs> like we're supposed to be as, uh, as a race and as a, as a people uh, way more progressive in our thinking and our and the way that we communicate, um, you know, those things to to to, to others, um, and I, it, it it bothered me. But I knew that, like, you know, I knew it bothered you, you know, a lot more. And you're right; you were. It was probably one of your worst games, if not your worst game, as a college player. Um, and uh, you know, after the game, Coach Amaker had given his speech. Uh, I had grabbed you and like you said, in the locker room. And I just wanted you to know that one, I understood it, um, that I heard it and I felt for you. Uh, but I also understood it because it happened to me. Um, you were more a primary player than I was. And, uh, you know, for them to try to attack you was a way for them to get you out of their game so their team could have success. And I was just like, you know, moving forward, people because you're good are going to try to take you out of your game please do not allow their ignorance to defeat you on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish i was in i was in uh spokane washington uh recruiting one day and i was walking home from dinner and uh, i was out there by myself and uh there was a car that drove by and you know yelled the n-word and then threw something at me in the middle of downtown spokane and i was staying at a resort uh that a week before roger moore the one of the the guys that was uh the james bond character was staying at so i'm just thinking like damn i'm in a place where you know celebrities come and hang out and use this place as a retreat uh it's a beautiful country out here you know, we're in, we're, 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 we're so far past, uh, you know, the, the forties, fifties and sixties where, you know, those type of things have occurred, uh, more so, you know, it, 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 and it just kind of just made me reflect on a lot of the things. So when I shared that with you, you know, I just wanted you to know that you, you're not the only one, you know, there's, uh, those, there's those kind of things that are happening. And unfortunately they're still happening, Jay. Yeah, and I remember when you said that to me, in my mind, I don't, I never said this, I never told you this, but in my mind, I was just like, dude, that's so much worse. Like, like he was calling me something verbally. You were getting something thrown at you physically. And like, to me, like when I was at Yale and we we're coming out and they got the student section right there by that tunnel and I'm coming out and these dudes like are, these college students in the, in the student section are drunk and their re- eyes are red and bloodshot and I'm running off the court and they're like, you know, a foot away from me, yelling at me, like talking about my eyes, talking about me supposed to be in the orchestra, all this stuff. Like that is verbal. But when you told a story of something physical coming, I was like, that's a different level. 
And that's when I realized, not only do you understand what I'm going through, you more than understand what I'm going through. And, and the one thing that I always say, like, it's hilarious because I say it to everybody now, they always ask this question and I act like it came from me, but it didn't, it came from you. Um, <laughs> but I just regurgitate it is like, you said to me that night, you said, look, when something happens like this, when racism happens, like they're trying to, one, they're trying to get you out your game. So they're giving you negative energy, right? You're receiving this negative energy. And now it's like a, a turning point for you. Like it's a juncture, critical juncture. Like you got two ways to go. You either take that and you turn that negative energy into something positive where you're focused and you're like, really you know what you want and you're like okay that happened but i'm gonna be even more focused i'm gonna play even better and this is actually gonna help me or you could do exactly what they want you to do which is to self-implode self-destruct which is what i did that night and so ever since then that's what i've always told other people is like hey when that comes when that when that energy comes like you're at a critical juncture and you have two directions to go and it is it's on you to be able to figure out how to channel that energy for black lives matter it was a lot about the public acknowledging the injustices and the violence perpetrated against the black community. Uh, for Stop Asian Hate, it's about overcoming the invisibility that Asian Americans feel to make the public care about the violence that's going on. And in both situations, like we're seeing a lot of violence, right? And that's why like th these things hit different to me, like everything I ever experienced was verbal. But when I see people getting stabbed in the back, getting punched in the face, getting killed, getting set on fire, like physical attacks of violence. I mean, that's a whole nother level from anything that I have experienced. And so, you know, when we wanted to talk about cross racial solidarity, when we want to talk about the issues that the world is going through, I mean, there's no better person than you to be able to talk through this. And there's so much pain and violence going on. I mean, what do you see as a win for us as, as a nation or as humanity to get to a better place. Um, and, and you know, tying off of that, what can basketball players and coaches do to help us get there? And so um, I kind of just want to give you the an open space to talk about, man, what, what do we need to do? What would be considered a win to get to a better place? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a lot in the, a lot to unpack right there, Jay. And uh, I'll try to do my best. I mean, I grew up in Washington, DC, I'm 49. Uh, look good though, Jay, don't I? Like yeah. Haircut. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I too. <laughs> you know, but when I grew up in DC, I, I grew up, uh, my mom, uh, worked in a grocery store and, uh, single, single mom home, single, fixed single parent home. Uh, I got an older brother and older sister. And, uh, you know, for me, it was like, just how do I survive and not end up dead or in jail? Um, so athletics and sports was a big part of my growth and development and who I am as a person. Um, I owe everything to being an athlete. Um, I owe everything to my community that raised me. Um, and I think that the community part has kind of deteriorated in a way that um, we don't have uh, the support that I had or the generations previously had um, that you know people have today. There was rec centers and opportunities for kids to get off the street, um, to do something that was more, you know, constructive than destructive. Um, and so, you know, today in, 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 our, in our communities, a lot of these rec centers are not uh, open anymore because of, you know, resources that, uh, you know, are not there. Um, so now what are young men and women are going to do when they grow up? You know, there's not that community. There's not the community policing. Uh, they don't have opportunities to kind of grow and develop and be kids. So now we get to the point where things go from, you know, let's, uh, let's, 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 you know, channel our energy and our, in our, in our, in our, our, you know, in things into different ways. Um, and, and I think that we have to get back to a little bit more of a community based, uh, you know, kind of, you know, world, to be honest with you. Um, I think we need allies, Jay. Um, you know, black folks need people like you. Asian folks need people like me. Um, I think that is really important. You know, we need white, white faces and men and women and, you know, positions of power to, to join, you know, what you and I are trying to do for our communities and for people. I know we're coming up on the one year anniversary of uh, Mr. George Floyd's murder. Uh, and thankfully we have some justice that has taken place uh, with some police brutality. Uh, 
thank God that the young lady who recorded the video uh, had the patience and the poise for, you know, the time that she did and recording it so everything could be broadcast to the world. Um, that's one of the most important videos that will ever be shot in the history of videos. Um, and it's great that that was, uh, was all caught on tape because Jay, when I grew up, man, there was, there was opportunities and times or times when, you know, I had friends that would be driving in our neighborhood, police would stop them because they had a nice car or just would stop them because they were driving while black and would, you know, throw something in their car and try to arrest them, you know, because they planted something and, you know, but, you know, so we just got to get to a world, man, where there's love, there's peace. There's people that's trying to help one another. Um, that is very, you know, that's, 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 I, it's, I know it doesn't sound realistic and it's not realistic, but ultimately, man, that's, that's kind of how people have to start living so we can all move forward uh, and make this place an incredible world, which, which it is and which we can make even better. One of the first things is, you know, that you talked about that really uh, struck me deeply was the concept of what you said, driving while black. Um, the reason why is because we need to, if, if we really want to get to a better place, we want to have a win in, in this world, it's, it's to become aware of what's actually going on. One of my high school teammates who I'm close with, grew up with, my, you know, we grew up, you know, in the Bay Area. First year that he got his license, he got pulled over 11 times, 11 times in one year, zero tickets. Every time it was just uh, suspicious behavior um, or we're looking for a suspect or no explanation at all. Um, 11 times, zero tickets, like, and, and to me, like, that's when I started to at least be a little bit aware. And, and this is something that like, I'm gonna be very honest right here. Like a lot of people see me, my my image, my brand or whatever. And they're like, oh, you know, and they, they elevate me. Like, I'm like, like, I know what I'm always talking about. Like I have it all together. I, I need to, it bothers me because I don't and I wanna cut it down. but. When I talk about cross-racial solidarity, like if I did not have, like what you're basically saying is we need community. You said community. You said, look at my daughter. My daughter can grow up. My daughter can have exposure to different people, different colors, like learn different cultures. Like that is so important because that is what we need to do is the, the reason why we're there. Are, part of the reason why there's so many divides is we don't have enough exposure and we're not willing to listen. We're not willing to get outside of our comfort zones. We don't have a community. We aren't seeing each other as equals. We aren't seeing each other as one humanity. And one of the things that I will totally be honest about is growing up, I only knew, what I knew of black people was what Hollywood taught me. And I watched movies like Rush Hour and things like that. And so all I knew was, hey, this is, I, I didn't have any black friends. And so, you know, for me, I would think like, oh, growing up, I was like, oh, if, if, if I saw a black person be like, oh, they're probably less educated or like, I need to lock my door. Like those types of things, like I'm gonna be, and that's why I said, I'm gonna be very honest. And I'm gonna cut down this, this tree of like, oh, Jeremy knows it. Like, no, like I grew up with a lot of false stereotypes, misconceptions about black people. And it wasn't, it was only because I hooped. And then I had so many black friends and black coaches and black, like people that I had exposure to that it was like, man, like everything I thought, like it was just like what I was fed. And now like my whole perspective has shifted so much. Even my parents, I saw my parents, like my parents thought a certain way, same thing. We saw whatever they saw in movies. Then they started becoming friends with my black, with my black teammates and my black teammates parents and next thing you know i'm playing for the rockets and my mom is grabbing brunch like by you know once every two weeks to four weeks with james harden and patrick beverly's mom like that's amazing and they became legitimate friends and i think like that's why like community is so important that's why things like basketball and other things are so important to be able to bring people together. I, I texted this to you, I said this to somebody else, but just your ability to understand the game, to get along with people, to bring the best out of people. I mean, basketball has given both of us so much. Can you talk about the beauty of the game culturally? Can you talk about how basketball can play an important role in allyship, how it can be a hook, you know, to bring people to the table, like not like to bring people to the table in terms of like, coming together, learning about each other, developing friendships and experiences together. Can you talk about the game and how that ties into this? No doubt, Jay, no doubt. And well said, I, I appreciate your, you, you sharing what you just shared. It, uh, it really resonates with me and I'm pretty sure it's gonna resonate with a lot of people. 
Um, I, I, I've always looked at basketball as a, you know, a beautiful team sport. And with that, I, I love that you have to really depend on and rely on five people uh, or four other people to, to have success in, 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 in win uh, at, in basketball. Um, you know, it's a game that because there's, you know, because the way that it's played, um, it takes communication to be successful, right? And with that, I think you can establish trust. Um, even if there's, you know, we talked about Stuyvesant Town and, and playing out at the courts at Stuytown. Um, even if it's going to play 5-1-5 at Stuytown, if you want to win and have a chance to stay on the court, you're going to have to depend and trust the four other guys that you may not know out on that court. And, you know, for that moment or those moments that you're out there, you guys are bonding. You guys are, are gelling. You guys are doing something in a way that, you know, you probably don't even understand that you're doing. Um, and, and that's the beauty of sport. That's the beauty of basketball. And with that, you know, there's an opportunity for, you know, I've, I've worked with the U.S. State Department to uh, go to Senegal and be a part of, you know, it, it was basketball without borders before basketball without borders. I've, I've lectured and taught basketball over in Turkey, again, with the U.S. State Department. Um, so just to be able to have those relationships where you are in another country and you're, uh, you know, you guys all have something that is in common, but that thing that has you in common can lead to conversations that are bigger than just basketball. Uh, so sport does that, basketball does that, and it's an incredible platform. Uh, and I think it's an incredible bridge that, you know, we can use uh, to really develop more harmony uh, between you know, racist in, in countries and in issues uh, that we are experiencing, you know, challenges with right now. That is why I love basketball. Like, I don't like golf or, or tennis or like swimming and individual sports that way because there isn't that team. And, and basketball transcends language, man. Like, when I couldn't really speak Chinese, like, but I would go and hoop and they only spoke Chinese and I only spoke English at the time. But like, you kind of like, and you were like kind of almost talking without being able to verbally communicate within with the same language it was just like there's a beauty of like man it, it goes beyond just the, the the normal language or the it, it breaks down it easily breaks down the barriers because it gives you a common ground that you can stand on and, and i love that about about you know sports and and for those of you guys who don't know uh coach blake is a head coach for the howard bison um and, and so yep there we go and and uh you know I, it's just uh to me like to be in a con that conference to be at that school goes beyond just like i mean there's a lot of value and importance and representation that comes along being the head coach at howard and, and so you know i'll always be rooting for you and in tuning into that because honestly like um one i believe in you as a coach but two like I think we both understand at this point, like what we're doing is bigger than basketball. For anybody who's like listening in, it's just like, doesn't feel like they, they're qualified to be able to talk. What would you suggest for them to do to be able to make this world a better place? Now that's a, that's a great question. And, and first and foremost, you know, there's, there's always strength through prayer, right? And uh, I, I, I believe that. Um, I, I found that being a, a, a basketball coach and being a head coach uh, is a lonely job. And, uh, you know, there's uh, so prayer has been really big for me and has given me a strength that I uh, that I've been able to persevere through a lot of things so far in my my early tenure. Um, there's always opportunities either through churches or schools um, and then, you know, for for people who need to find a voice, um, you know, schools with either your guidance counselors, your teachers, um, administration. Um, you know, those places I think are built for uh, the building of, of youth. There's a saying that it always takes a village to takes a, a village to build a child, right? And you know, that's what our school systems and that's what schools are are, are there for. Um, you know, also in, in your churches, there's there's always there are people there that are very supportive, uh, people who want to listen and people who want to share their experiences. Uh, so I think those are two great places to start. Um, you know, certainly if there's community organizations that a person can uh, seek out and utilize, 
um, in whatever they are uh, believing in or whatever they are, you know, the cause that they want to try to push forward. Um, there, there's those kind of opportunities that, uh, as well. Yeah, and I, I agree. And I think, you know, one thing I've also been saying to anybody who's listening and wants to do something, start small. Don't feel like you have to come in and make a big wave. Don't feel like you have to come in and send a tweet to millions or start a brand new campaign or whatever. Like, start small. Um, it's like if, if somebody asked me, like, how, how can I become a better basketball player? I wouldn't tell them, like, go sign up for the nearest league and win it. Like, I would sit, give them something small, like, hey, let's start small here today. And, and you build from there. But for anybody listening, I would say, like, small things you can do, like, have a conversation with somebody that maybe you don't have, uh, who, who you aren't as comfortable having a conversation with. Or maybe it's somebody that you've known for a long time, but you've never really broached a certain topic. Go for it, have, ask a question, ask a question, start a conversation. I would say, educate yourself, right? Like to me, I didn't learn about, I didn't like, you know, people say ignorance is bliss. No, in this situation, that's not true. Like ignorance, if you don't understand what is happening, like you cannot, if you're not educated and informed, you cannot really, develop a deep conviction or know what it means to make a difference. And so for me, like I, I didn't know Asian American history. Like once I learned that stuff, Vincent Chin, Japanese incarceration camps, Chinese Exclusion Act. Once I learned that, you know, the the, tra- the, the railroad and, and everything and the way that it was, that whole thing transpired, how Chinatowns came to be. If I don't understand that stuff, I won't have the same conviction that I have. Same with African American history, these types of things. I mean, go learn, go educate yourself. There's plenty of resources, there's plenty of people, podcasts, books, online. Like, these are all ways that you can start or just do one small thing to love one person. Thank you so much, Coach Blake, for uh, joining me today on Let's Talk About It. That was uh, that was amazing. Hey Jay, no doubt. I really appreciate it, man. It's uh, this was great. This was unbelievable. It was seriously dope, man. And uh, I think you know leaving we can kind of the parting shot you know from me um you know i'd like to thank slam i'd like to thank yourself but also you know we're in a moment in time where you know black lives do matter and we need to stop asian hate Uh, there needs to be accountability there needs to be community there needs to be some togetherness with this and that's the only way we're going to get through this jay yeah and 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 like you said the only way to get there is together we got to be allies for each other we got to speak up, but we also have to listen. We have to have conversations. We have to have tough conversations and we have to fight for each other. And that's how we're going to get to a better place where we all belong. Um, so thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Um, let's talk about it. Yeah.